Welcome to Basic Gospel, everybody. With Bob Christopher and Richard Piper, I'm Bob Davis, here to welcome you to our weekly teaching edition as we study through the pages of the New Covenant Journey Study Guide. If you don't yet have your copy, just go online to basicgospel.net slash teaching. Again, that's basicgospel.net slash teaching. And a reminder that the phone lines are not open today so that everyone can listen and benefit from this study. So with that, it's Basic Gospel's weekly teaching edition, everybody. And now here's Bob Christopher. Well, thanks, Bob. We are in Chapter 4, God's Will, the legal document, Is It Valid?, I mean, everything we've talked about as far as this uh, this journey through the New Covenant uh-huh. is concerned has, has come from the Bible. Uh, but can we rely on the Bible? Is it valid? Is it authoritative? Is it, is it true? And what we've learned thus far in this particular chapter, chapter 4, are, are these things. First, the validity of the Word of God really rests on the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. So we're just reviewing right now, looking at some of the points that we have, have have studied up to this point. So the validity of the Bible rests on the person of Jesus Christ. So since he is God, we can know with confidence that the word of God is true, reliable, and enduring. Yes. I mean, if Jesus Christ isn't God, we might as well throw the Bible, of, uh, just Bible away. Yeah, right it on. just really means nothing to us. The second thing that we've learned is that the Word of God is inspired, or God breathed. Men were moved by God's Spirit to write down the very words of God, and that's true of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was the same Spirit of God moving uh, in the hearts of men back in the days many, many years ago to write down the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. Uh, that moved in the hearts of the apostles to write down this New Testament that we read today. So it was the very Spirit of God that moved men to write down the very words of God. And so with that, the same weight and authenticity is given to the Old Testament, to Jesus' words, and to the apostles' words. You know, many people will read red-letter edition Bibles, and they will say the red letters have more meaning and are more valuable to us than the rest of the Word of God. Well, Jesus said time and time again, the things that you hear me say, it's not me saying, it's God speaking through me. So he was relying upon God's Spirit to give him the words to study to say. And the apostles wrote those words down in what we know as the four uh, gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so it was the Spirit of God that moved Jesus to speak. It was the Spirit of God that moved the Apostle Paul to write down the many letters that he wrote. It was the Spirit of God that moved in the heart of the Apostle John to write his letters, write his gospel account, and to write the book of Revelation. The same was true of Peter, yes. all of those guys. So the Holy Spirit was the source of everything that we have in this book. And so we can count on it. We can depend upon it. We can know that the word of God is true. And then the last thing that we learned as far as this chapter is concerned is that the Bible prepares our hearts for God's work in and through us. Uh, It does something to our hearts to prepare us to receive what God has for us and then to trust God to work in and through us. Yes. And that we learn through Second uh, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So now we come to the big question, and this is on page 44. How can we really understand the Bible? I know when I started college, uh, I felt like I had a clean slate, and I was really going to be God's guy at the University of Georgia. And I developed a New Testament reading plan. I was going to read four chapters every single day. And I started in the book of Matthew, and I read the four chapters. And then the next day, I read chapters 5 through 8. If anyone had asked me, what did you read, all I would have been able to say is that I read chapters 1 through 4 or 5 through 8 or 9 through whatever. But I couldn't really grasp the meaning of what I was reading. Why? Because... um, my mind was veiled. I, I, I had no real understanding. I wasn't relying on the Spirit of God to reveal the meaning of the Word of God to me. So I was left to figure it out with my own understanding. And that just didn't work out so well. It became a very boring book to yes. me. 
So I didn't know how to understand it then, but I've learned how. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how we can truly understand the Word of God. And we're going to spend the bulk of this teaching edition in a passage in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16. It is one of the most important passages in all the Word of God. And I encourage you, if you're following along with us, to go to your Bibles and to mark this passage, to read it, to read it again and then to study it and really come to grips with what this particular passage is saying to us and how we can understand the Bible. So first, let me just read this passage for us. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What an amazing statement that very last sentence is, the fact that we have the mind of Christ. And we're going to get there and show what that really means. But we have prepared a series of questions to help us really dig out the meaning of this passage and how we can understand the Word of God. So it starts with the fact that no eye is seen, no ear is heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So we don't know all the blessings that God has in mind for us in the person of Christ Jesus. We can't discern that through our own understanding, through human reasoning and logic. All we know is that we are in God's debt. We owe something, and what we owe is punishment. What we are to receive is punishment. That's what we know. That's what we justly deserve. So beyond that, we can't figure out what God has for us other than judgment. But God has given us the Spirit of God to reveal to us what God has for us. And so we're going to start right there. Who reveals what God has prepared for you? Well, the answer is The the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God reveals to us the meaning of the Word of God. So how can we understand the Bible? Uh, Answer number one is right there. Rely upon the Spirit of God to reveal the meaning to you. So if you want to know what the Word of God means and how to apply it in day-to-day life, trust the teacher, the Holy Spirit, to reveal the meaning. Now, this word reveal is an interesting word. It's the Greek word apocalypto. Uh, we know it as apocalypse. It's the revelation yes. of Jesus Christ, the same, the same word. And here it means this, to remove a veil or covering, exposing to open view what was before hidden. So it removes a veil and then allows us to see what was once hidden. It means to make manifest or reveal a thing previously secret or unknown. So God's Spirit does a twofold work in revealing to us the meaning. First, he removes the veil that covers our eyes. Yes. So we see a number of passages in the Word of God that show us exactly what this veil is made of. So in 2 Corinthians three thirteen and 14, uh, Paul is is striking a contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant, yes. 
And he says, whenever the old covenant is read, a veil remains over the hearts of the people. Why? Most folks read the new covenant with a sense of self-righteousness, with a sense of human effort. Here are the things that I need to do in order to please God. Here are the things that I need to accomplish totally and completely in order to have right standing with God. So it's built and based upon human effort and self-righteousness. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He removes the veil of self-righteousness. That's the first thing he does. The second thing is he removes the veil of human reasoning and logic. This is something that is beyond our normal human minds. We yeah. can't figure out the gospel. We can't figure out the goodness of God. We can't figure out those very things. And we see a very telling story about this exact uh, situation. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter stood up with confidence and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, that is correct. And you, you didn't come to this through your own understanding. God the Father revealed yes. it to you. Now, how did God the Father reveal that to Peter? I, I think as Peter watched Jesus perform all of these miracles and he heard Jesus say that this was the Father working through him and all the things that he claimed about himself, God the Father just opened Peter's eyes to the truth that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And then Jesus went on to explain to Peter that he was going to go to Jerusalem, was going to be handed over to uh, the Jewish leaders. He was going to be tried and crucified, and then on the third day, he was going to be raised back to life. Well, what did Peter say? Oh, oh no. no, not you, Lord. I will never allow that. And Jesus immediately said, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because you're th seeing things from a human perspective and not God's perspective. So for us to understand what the Word of God means, the Spirit of God has to remove the veil of human reasoning and logic. We can't see this thing through our perspective. We have to see it through God's. And then the third thing is the veil of Satan's lies. Uh, the, the God of this world, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, has blinded the eyes of the lost so that they cannot see the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if somebody's going to see, the Spirit of God has to remove the veil of Satan's lies. And we're all under that. We yes. were all under that until the truth of Jesus was made known to us. So the Holy Spirit removes the veil of and then he turns us to the Lord. He turns our thoughts, our minds, our eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So the Holy Spirit gives us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That's how he reveals the meaning of the Word of God to us. It's quite amazing. Absolutely. Well, friends, you're listening to Basic Gospels Weekly Teaching Edition, and our study guide, of course, is entitled The New Covenant Journey. To get your own copy and study along with us each week, go online to basicgospel.net slash teaching. There you'll immediately see our Teaching Edition page, and from there you can request your copy of The New Covenant Journey. And again, that's basicgospels.net slash teaching. A quick reminder, too, that because this is a teaching edition, the phone lines are not open today. Again, I'm Bob Davis here with Bob Christopher and Richard Pfeiffer. And with that, back to our study. Well, thanks, Bob. So we're going to pick up on the bottom of page uh, 44, and we're just going to work through this section. So, Richard, I'll ask the question, and then you'll help Ooh. answer, okay? Oh, hope I can find it. <laughs> so we're on question two at the bottom of page 44. The uh, Spirit of God reveals to us what God has prepared for us. So what does the Spirit do? The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So that's what the Spirit of God uh, of God does. He searches all things, even the deep things of, of God. So can we know just in and of ourselves the thoughts of God? Do we have that ability or ca capacity to do no. that? No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. For, the, you know, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the, spirit, the man's spirit within him? 
in the same way no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Yeah. So the three of us are sitting in this uh, studio together, and I don't really know what you're thinking, Bob Davis, and you may be looking at me saying, I don't know what you're thinking either. And we're both looking at Richard saying we don't we have a clue what he's, yeah. Yeah, he's that's, thinking. That's normal. <laughs> we, we, we can't read each other's minds. Now, I know our wives would like for us to do that, be able to read <laughs> their minds and know exactly what they're thinking, but that's just impossible for us to do. The only way that we are going to know what somebody else is thinking is if they tell us, here's what's on my mind, here's what's going on in this head of mine. And when they lay it out there on the table, then we can say, I know what you're thinking. Well, in the same way, we have no earthly idea what God is thinking. We can speculate on that, but boy, our speculations are going to be far from the truth. Um, We could go out on the street and we could ask 100 people, what is God thinking about you right now? And we'll have 100 different answers, and I guarantee you, out of those 100 99 probably are going to be so far away from the truth, it would be unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We don't know what God is thinking until God reveals it to us, and he does so by the Spirit. So which spirit have you received or have we received in Christ? We have received the spirit who was from God, not the spirit of the world. We had the spirit of the world. We were controlled by the spirit of of the world. Our thinking was shaped by the spirit of this world, but we've been given the spirit who is from God. That's huge, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And and when does that happen, Richard? When do we get the gift of God's spirit? At the moment of salvation, when we are born again. That is defined by receiving the Holy Spirit, being made alive by the spirit. Paul made this statement in Romans 8 that you, if you don't have the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ, you, you don't belong to God. So the fact that you have the Spirit of God living in you defines you as a believer. That's what it means to be a Christian. For a person to say that they're a Christian, it means that they have God's Spirit yes. living inside of them. And God's Spirit is totally different than the Spirit of that's in the world. So why did we receive the Spirit from God? So that we may understand what God has freely given us. What are some of those things? What are some of those things that God has freely given us? Well, life, love, forgiveness, um, justification, righteousness, everything that all those big theological words that everybody scratches their, their heads over, really you don't have to scratch your head over it. You just say, Lord, Tell me what this is. And the Spirit tells us everything that we we need for life and give, godliness has been given to us. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms has been given to us. We have been declared to be the fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. We've been told we're sons and daughters of God. It goes on and on and on. And every one of those things is what the Spirit reveals to us. Absolutely. So let's go back to one of the ones that you listed there, forgiveness. Yes. Um, So we have ideas about forgiveness. You know, everybody has an idea about what forgiveness means. But do we really know what forgiveness is apart from God's Spirit revealing it to us? No. And the answer is no. Uh, It is amazing to look at um, the dictionary, the the Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, at the definition of the word forgive. Uh, They come up with a a definition, and then below it, there's a question. Why did you look up this this word? Well, people have responded. There's been over 60, 70 people that have responded to that. And when you read through those responses, you, you realize that even though they've read the definition, they still don't have a clue as to what forgiveness means. Why? Because forgiveness originated with God. Yes. God, the God who loves is also the God who forgives, and that's how we know his love and the fact that he has forgiven us. So this is something that we need to rely upon the Spirit of God to teach us the full meaning of the forgiveness of God. And when that settles into our hearts, when we've really gained God's view of forgiveness, that's when we're set free from our shame and our guilt and all those things. So if you're struggling with forgiveness, 
ask the Lord to reveal to you the true meaning of forgiveness. Yes. What does it mean that God has forgiven your sins once and for all? I guarantee you what he reveals to you will blow your <laughs> mind yes. and will change your life yes. forever. So God has given us his spirit to teach us the meaning of those things that he has freely given us. So is human wisdom enough? Never. Just can't be. Because it, it's, it's, it's just It's limited. so limited. Yeah. It, is, it is so limited by our experience, mm-hmm. isn't it? Um, we don't know the big picture. We don't know, um, you know, the whys and, and, and the wherefores and all of those things as to, to the, the making of this big picture. God does. We just know what we can sense with our five senses and, and those sort of things. So we have to allow the Spirit of God to explode those things out so that yes. we can really see it from his perspective. So can a person without the Holy Holy Spirit accept what the Spirit gives? No. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. Yesterday we experienced Thanksgiving, and so everybody sat around and gave thanks yeah. and uh, for all of the wonderful blessings. Uh, but there's a, 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 a scripture that says, um, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, that you give thanks in all things. Well, in the middle of, of horrendous uh, circumstances, we're supposed to give thanks? You mean that's the will of God? It just doesn't make sense to the human mind. But when God reveals it to us and shows us all that we have in Christ, then we can give thanks in all circumstances and carry out the will of God. It's so exciting. It doesn't make sense to the natural mind, but to the spiritual mind, it makes all the sense in the world. So let me ask this question real quickly. What about the lost? If they can't understand the things of the Lord, how are they going to be saved? Well, that's, that's the beauty of grace is, is the Spirit keeps working with them, albeit from the outside, drawing them to Jesus, asking them to look at Jesus, asking them important questions like, what does it mean to be forgiven? You know, uh, Are you satisfied with your life? How is your current situation working for you? I mean, those, those kinds of questions that we ask are Spirit-directed. Now, that doesn't mean the Spirit has taken up residence, but the Spirit is wooing us, constantly drawing us to himself so that in the kindness of God, we will repent and come to faith in him. So he's always taking the things of the Lord Jesus and making them known to people, to the lost. He's showing that their sin is rooted in unbelief in Jesus that righteousness is found in Jesus, that judgment took place in Jesus, and that everything's taken care of. And with that, he removes the veil so that they can see this gospel message. And then once they're saved, he begins to renew their mind, to reshape their mind. And we see this powerful end statement in this passage. Uh, What do we have as a result of God revealing to us the meaning of the word of God? We have the very mind of Christ. And that's such a powerful concept. You notice this started with the, the word mind, the human mind, and now the mind of Christ. We have the option of having our mind that's been sucked down into the sewer by sin to have it renewed and pulled back up into union with the mind of Christ so that we can truly understand what he's given us. Yeah, so as we go to the word of God, allow the spirit of God to reveal the meaning of of that word to us, then we begin to think with the mind of Christ in all situations. What's the mind of Christ in this marriage situation? What's the mind of Christ in this uh, family situation? What's the mind of Christ in this friendship, in this church, in this relationship? So as we rely upon the word uh, or the Holy Spirit to teach us the word, we gain the mind of Christ. Yes. That's a powerful thing. And then the final thing is rely upon the Spirit, then read the word to grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. This word of God truly is God's testimony concerning his son. And that's what the Holy Spirit makes known to us, the person and work 
of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And friends, as we come to the end of this teaching edition of Basic Gospel through the pages of the New Covenant Journey, we thank you for being with us. Now for Bob Christopher, for Richard Pfeiffer and the ministry staff, I'm Bob Davis inviting you to be with us again on our next live edition on Monday. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.